welcome to the Great Depression recorded lecture. Uh, this is a second recorded lecture that you should be going through. Um, if it does help you, if you, obviously if you still just want to go take notes off of the actual slideshows themselves, totally fine. Uh, make sure when you are going in order, start with the 1920s background slides and then get into the Great Depression slides um, as that's the flow that you should be following. So let's go through the Great Depression lecture. Uh, here's the agenda. We're going to go through the overview of the Great Depression, the causes of the Great Depression, and a little bit of um, some side notes on notable people, policies, and events. Uh, just fair warning, it's not the best looking PowerPoint ever made. Uh, it's a lot of just general words, not a very exciting theme, uh, but it is what it is. All right, gets the job done. So, here you go. Overview of the Great Depression, 1929 through the early 1940s. And the reason why that has an asterisk by the 1940s is that depends on who you ask on when the Great Depression actually ends. A lot of people will point to World War II, the start of World War II for the United States in 1941 as the end of the Great Depression because we get kicked off into this gigantic boom of industrialization and uh, just overall production in order to fuel the war effort. Um, but there's a lot of people that also say that really the Great Depression doesn't end until after the war stops in uh, 1945. So it just depends. It's, you can talk anywhere from 1941 to 1945, 1946, somewhere in that range, but generally it ends in the 1940s. And the 1929 on the early side, while the stock market crash does not directly cause the Great Depression, it was a contributing factor. That's why we put 1929 as kind of the early start of it. So how would you define the Great Depression if you're looking at it like a 10,000 foot view? Well, it's an era of mass unemployment, financial ruin, and hunger for millions of Americans. It's not just everybody losing all their money, but you're talking about entire life savings, land, houses, anything that anybody owns is basically taken away. Everybody loses just about everything, and they're really struggling to scrape by day to day to feed families, uh, to make sure they have common basic human elements and needs such as shelter, food, clothing, water, you name it. Um, that being said, though, while everybody is generally in a rough state of affairs, it's disproportionately affecting African-American and Latino populations even more. Uh, you're talking about, during this time period, mass deportation of Mexican-Americans due to increased racial violence over the struggle for scarce jobs. Right? This is happening particularly uh, in Southern California. The city of Los Angeles uh, undertakes massive deportations um, just because everybody is fighting for these jobs and it, cre it creates an atmosphere of increased racial violence uh, for scarce jobs. Uh, and then if you look at statistically, the unemployment rate amongst African Americans is about 50% versus the overall rate about 25% uh, nationwide. So everybody is affected, but if you kind of look at it through a multicultural lens, again, you're talking about people of color being significantly affected more than um, white Americans. So a little bit more detail here. The Great Plains states like North, South Dakota, Nebraska, Kansas, Oklahoma, Texas are all experiencing what would become known as the Dust Bowl, which is severe droughts leading to dust storms, tornadoes, twisters, um, which are basically destroying entire farms, towns, um, the entire natural landscape in the plains is basically devastated. Uh, entire, you're talking about these dust storms where it's picking up soil and kind of uprooting the earth, and you will have that dust being carried away all the way to the East Coast, all right? This is a gigantic movement. Um, those of you who have ever seen uh, The Wizard of Oz, well, that's taking place, those twisters and the farm setup is taking place during the Depression. Uh, you also have the beginnings of hobos, so what we know as kind of people hopping on trains, traveling nomadic, um, town to town, city to city, uh, traveling the country looking for work, food, and shelter, against the kind of the origin of the hobo narrative of people just kind of riding the rails um, with all that they could carry uh, and trying to find whatever they can to kind of sustain. Uh, you also have a creation of shanty towns where people are evicted from their homes due to financial ruin. They lose everything, including their homes. Um, and they strike up kind of these shacks um, right around in the downtown cores. Uh, they become known as Hoovervilles because President Hoover does a terrible job of managing the depression. Um, so generally, in a general sense, these shanty towns where people are kind of making makeshift shacks in downtown areas become known as Hooverville shanty towns, kind of interchangeable. So, where you have the overview of a long period of time where everybody is 
more or less financially ruined and they are struggling to get on by on a day-to-day -day basis the cause is you can't just boil it down to one thing um, it's actually a combination of things that really end up causing the depression you're talking about these tariffs and war debt policies which basically shut the door to foreign market markets for American goods you have a gigantic crisis in the agricultural sector uh, overwhelmingly easy credit being available to just about everybody uh, and ultimately you do have a gigantic unequal distribution of wealth so if you combine all those that's where you're really getting into the causes of the depression it's not just the stock market crashing in 1929 um, it's a lot more than that it's a lot more complex so we're going to go through one by one the first one again tariffs and war debt policies cutting down on the foreign markets for american goods what had happened was that after World War I, Germany's made to repay the war debts. Again, you're talking about reparations for the war. They're being punished for being a major insider of the war. So American banks are taking advantage of this, saying, hey, Germany is going to need a lot of money to repay and rebuild after World War I. We're going to loan them out a ton of money, and we're going to charge extreme interest rates, all right, just because the demand for capital is so high. All right, they're taking... Uh, kind of the poor state of affairs in Germany and taking advantage of that in order to make more money. So what happens is that that crash in October 1929, well, the American banks, where they're really worried because you're having a run on money, everybody's being very scared over kind of the future. Well, they are, they're demanding full payments of those loans that they made. However, the depression was not just centered in the United States. It's a global event. And ultimately, those German debtors cannot make the demand. So, well, what happens as a result? Well, you become a lot more protective of things. So the government and the financial industry in the United States go ahead and collaborate to pass these protective tariffs basically intended to protect American industries from basically losing money. Right? You want to protect all American goods, American banks, American manufacturing. Um, you want to protect everything rather than lose money internationally. But as a result, by making kind of the barrier to entry of foreign companies and foreign investments so high you disable international trade in the process so a big example of this was the Hawley Smoot Tariff Act in 1930 it was supposed to protect American farmers and manufacturers from foreign competition however it reduced the flow of goods into the United States and other countries from earning American currency to buy American goods so if you're like a British company for example you can't sell your goods in the United States to American buyers who would then give you dollars and then you cannot go ahead and use those dollars to buy American goods all right so it basically eliminating a kind of realistic foreign trade it makes unemployment worse and many countries as a result are saying well if you're gonna do this I'm gonna raise tariffs of my own so they raise their own tariffs and then at the end of the day world trade falls by more than 40 percent within a few years all right, the next cause. So you're talking about crisis in the agricultural sector. No matter what time period it's been, no matter who you talk to, agriculture has always been a key portion of the United States economy. All right, it's, think about it. We, we rely so much on agriculture for the bulk of our goods that we consume on a day-to-day -day basis. All right, they are so valuable to the United States. Um, if they struggle, then we all struggle. All right, so increased production that had happened during World War I resulted in farmers planting more and taking out loans for more and oh my typo on that in my bad guys it should be taking out loans for more land and more equipment uh, what happens when you make a powerpoint real fast nevertheless so you have increased production that's meant to kind of meet all the needs of the war again you have to feed soldiers everybody has to kind of chip in however once the war stops that gigantic demand to feed all the soldiers really falls through the crop prices inevitably decline by more than 40 percent okay so what do farmers try to do then well the farmers are saying well if i boost production maybe i can help hopefully sell more crops and then maybe make more money just because more crops being sold in theory more money however supply demand if you have such a gigantic supply right ultimately it's not scarce people are the prices are going to go down again you you just have too much it actually drives the prices down further than if you didn't have enough um, so what happens then well farmers can't recoup all that money and they're defaulting on loans and the banks that supported them and rural communities actually begin to fail themselves 
So Congress sees this and they say, we'll try to support you with measures that would sup utilize price supports. So basically like setting a kind of a floor, a limit on what the, what the price could be for certain crops like wheat, corn, cotton, and tobacco. Uh, it was called the McNary-Hohen Bill. Basically, government would buy surplus crops at guaranteed prices and sell them on the world market, kind of ensure the price of certain crops. However, President Coolidge vetoes the bill twice. He doesn't want any government intervention. He's a strong believer that the market will fix the market. Right? If we do not do anything, it'll eventually kind of fix itself. But it doesn't. Right? This is kind of the collapse of agriculture, and farms are honestly some of the places where people struggle the most. Uh, next one, availability of easy credit. For those of you concerned or confused about what credit means, especially in your lives now, um, the credit is this whole concept of you buy now and you pay later. All right? So if, if you don't have the money up front, well, you can still get whatever the item is. You'll just pay back the small loan over time. But that includes monthly in payments with mostly interest charges. So during the 1920s, you see this on a widespread basis. All right? You still do, but 1920s is kind of creation of it. So where you have these inventions of cars and washing machines, refrigerators, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, Americans are saying, I want these luxuries, these kind of amenities in my house, but I don't have the money for them. So I'm going to use credit and loans to get the item, and eventually I'll pay it back. So a lot of Americans are actually living beyond their means by buying goods on this credit system. And businesses are saying, well, we can keep charging them interest, but they will still keep theoretically buying our goods, we're going to encourage them to pile up this consumer debt over time. But too much debt, you start looking in the mirror and saying, oh, this is a little too much and I need to cut back on my spending. And as a result, you've developed so much debt that you can't really pay it off. So credit, well, seems good on paper, right? I can get the goods without actually paying for it. You rack up so much debt and you can't pay it off and then suddenly those items get revoked, your house gets revoked, you lose your job, you kind of go into financial ruin. And the last one here is unequal distribution of wealth. All right, so the 1920s was an era of increased wealth. All right, in general, it's the roaring 20s, a lot of people are prospering. However, the rich are actually getting richer and the poor are actually getting poorer. In 1920, 1929, the wealthiest 1% sees an increase of 75% in their incomes rather than a 9% increase for Americans as a whole. Okay, so that 1% is seeing a gigantic increase versus uh, the rest of the country is only seeing almost 10%, right? Not, not a big jump as that wealthy is 1%. And statistically, more than 70% of families are actually earning less than $2,500 per year. Um, average Americans couldn't fully participate in those economic advances of the 20s, right? That entertainment, the luxuriousness, those parties. Um, all that, the average American can't actually do that. And what happens is that people don't actually have the money to purchase all these goods that factories are producing. Again, there's so much overproduction that there's just not enough people with enough money to buy anything, right? So those are kind of the main causes. Um, if you add them all up, that's where you get in the Great Depression. It's up to you guys to determine which one do you think played the biggest role. Um, it's just some, on a side note here, some notable people, policies, events, presidents, you have three of them. Coolidge, he kind of gets out of town before the Depression really happens, but he oversees the 1920s for the most part in kind of the uh, problems that the Roaring Twenties set up that would come to light in the Depression. Hoover, he lasts one term, does a terrible job of managing the Depression. And then you got FBR, which we'll talk about more uh, next week when we're talking about kind of how do we rebound. All right, what's the New Deal look like, and what, how does he kind of write the ship? Um, some policies-wise and events, you have Hoover, who actually oversees the building of Boulder Dam, which is now Hoover Dam, uh, biggest dam in the United States. You also have the Federal Home Loan Bank Act. Uh, again, the government trying to get involved in terms of home ownership and managing mortgages and things of that nature. Uh, Reconstruction Finance Corporation, again, we'll talk about that later, the Patman Bill, Bonus Army. Uh, this one's of note, this is where you had World War I veterans being promised by the government to be paid out of bonus in 1945, but obviously when the Depression hits, they want that money now. So you have thousands upon thousands of World War I veterans uh, marching in Washington, demanding these bonuses from uh, Congress. 
and it inevitably kind of ends up in a violent riot.